Okay, so um, this is going to walk through. So I've mentioned before that the task force for nature related financial disclosures requires us to quantify changes in the ecosystem. So this is a project started um, about two years ago, yeah, 2020, where um, I was trying to look at what type of uh, waste materials, you have an agrarian economy uh, and you want to create new construction products uh, from agricultural waste, what is viable? So um, one of the things, and so did the landscape analysis in uh, one plant that's commonly used across different African countries are bananas. Uh, you'll find that, you know, not everybody eats rice, not everybody eats wheat, but um, uh, you'll find bananas are pretty prevalent. And uh, there's trade. The other thing was where they trade flows of bananas from one country to the next and also which country. So if you look at the Latin American market, if you look at the Asian market, uh, those trade flows on bananas exist. So then you can try and piggyback on would there be industrial scale availability of the bananas as uh, raw materials. So uh, I thought, oh, well, you know, the peels, that, that, that's a really uh, easy to do consumer waste and you just train people to throw away their peels. Well, first was that it turns out I learned peels are edible. I, I, I don't eat them, but it turns out that they are edible. People in Asia use them to make uh, milkshakes. Um, they are also uh, highly uh, nutrient. So uh, the industry, the food industry itself is now using them to biofortify uh, cereals and, and wheat products. And the other part is that they, in traditional African diets, uh, they are a source of seasoning instead of salt. Mm -hmm. uh, and also mixed, uh, uh, for those who don't eat them as a salt, um, they are also mixed with animal feed. And so there's multiple edible streams on that. So that was the first red flag in terms of changes in the ecosystem. It wasn't necessarily just a uh, biological ecosystem. It was a human ecosystem change that you would be removing a, 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 a nutrient if you started. So then the next question was, OK, if we took the waste that is left after all this banana peel processing, what could we do? And because now you have a crushed substance and you could make a uh, great uh, carbon fiber. You know, once you, you, you char it, you can make great carbon fiber for uh, nanotubes. And there's lots of money in carbon fiber nanotubes. Uh, and uh, let me go to the next slide and show you. Uh, so they're used in uh, electronic devices, and I was looking for materials that we call that could be structural materials and therapeutic devices. Uh, and I'm not a medical expert, so I might be a little off on this, but the, the advantage of using, everybody says, you know, the, the risk of plastics. Uh, so you, you're trying to, when you're trying to deliver things or insert things into the body, you don't necessarily want organic substances because then it starts reacting with the organic components of your, your body itself. So typically on some of these medical devices, they look for non-organic uh, uh, materials. So you're now changing this banana peel into a non-organic structure and you can see what the nanotube looks like. Uh, and they've been heavily used uh, in the medical industry. And one of the things that we know when people talk about the precautionary principle is that um, you don't know what's going to happen in 10 years, in 10, uh, 10 generations, and you need for that data to start accumulating. And unfortunately, what we started to learn is that as the data accumulates between the fibers and the uh, characteristics of the carbon nanofiber tubes is that they're carcinogenic and the risk is as high as asbestos. And for those of you who know, asbestos and methyl, methyl 
Methothelioma is one of the, the, the greatest cancer. At this point, the Kenyan government is spending about, last estimate I had was in 2016, which could be higher now, about 10% of the health budget being spent on treating uh, asbestos-related cancers because we still have a lot of asbestos roofing. And these are, and then the, the, the risk with that is fragility. And, and the more they, things break and carbon nanotubes are also fragile. So the more things break apart, the higher uh, the, the, the cancer risk. Uh, but unfortunately, that is not something that, um, w you know, at the time that these were developed, the state of scientific thinking, uh, toxicology of inorganic matter wasn't at the forefront. It is now a, something that's coming to the forefront. So these are the kind of uh, issues that you start having to think about is um, then going quantifying changes to the ecosystem condition and extent and priority locations. Uh, this is where that network of networks and asking the global village and not just the chemical village, the medical research village, you start having to ask, like the way I found out about the food was um, not traditional research. I went to a food fair on and they were talking about circular economy uses. And I saw a lady that was really talking about banana chips. And I said, oh, uh, what about the peels? Uh, uh, what do you, are, are they waste? And she told me, absolutely not. Um, I don't know how many R&D companies would go to a food fair to <laughs> ask the lady selling banana chips whether or not uh, the, it's actually waste. So uh, you start having to look at then also with something like carbon fiber nanotubes, we don't have separation at source in Kenya. Uh, we don't have uh, advanced systems for uh, materials ha handling or um, like, let's say in European systems you have, if you're collecting plastics, you have, and you're going to recycle those. There's uh, the special equipment. If you have uh, dioxin or lead contaminated plastics here, it just goes into something called a uh, furnace pit <laughs> and uh, that, you know, it gets melted down in that way. Uh, to melt down things like um, asbestos, uh, you need uh, super high, I think it's about 1200 degrees Celsius heat, mm -hmm. which then kind of counteracts the net zero principle, <laughs> which is to use less emissions and less energy. So um, if, you're, if you're doing that innovation and, and, and you see that there's a commercial market for carbon nanofiber tubes, you need to really expand that village you're talking to, to be able to answer or even guesstimate that answer to that question that the task force for nature related financial disclosure is asking. Okay. And then, uh, go ahead. No, it's fine. I'm just, uh, maybe, I don't know if you want to have a couple of more slides, just looking at the time. You have yes. seen one more question. So I just would like maybe if you can, yeah, just go ahead for the next uh, two to three minutes if it's fine for you. Uh, okay. So then uh, we also have the problem of why do projects fail on green finance? And, and uh, I know the finance, financial industry believes they've standardized everything. Well, from the scientific perspective, they've not even begun. And so uh, trying to make sure that we have, um, the, we're talking the same, like my mother used to say, are we talking the same English? Uh, one of the things that uh, I know I get asked here a lot is, why can't you do um, R&D for uh, new products in uh, three years like we can do with fast moving consumer goods? And I was like, because this is not a fast moving consumer good. <laughs> um, uh, and also going through what it takes in terms of stakeholder engagement is a lot more so like you were saying, design thinking, we have to go through the research and the abstract and, and thinking about uh, the different components and the different risk measures that we're going to be up against. 
Uh, and what we're looking at is uh, Postal Lab being a way for different entities in an open system. There's also a risk of information leakage. So to have everybody in the same space and we look at how cost savings and communication and, and, and reaching out the target audience and having everybody in the same space, uh, looking at that. Uh, and that's what this slide is talking about, um, one digital co-working space where different entities can come and then that collaboration point that we need to get things towards the market. And the R&D is not just in the lab, it's how, meaning uh, when you're sitting at the table uh, doing your, uh, it's also the social R&D that's going to take to make things su succeed. Uh, different criteria so in terms of why things uh looking at processes uh, these look at low emissions pathways policies and scalability vulnerable populations just those are just three of the high level things that we need to do on the finance side but also on the scientific side there's even more i'm just putting uh, concepts that people are more familiar with. So if you think of each one of those bullet points is something that we have to then unpack and look at from a scientific risk perspective and a materials risk perspective, I think it starts getting a little more obvious as to why it takes. Uh, because then, for example, uh, in addition to that, one of the net zero requirements is less water consumption. So then you have to go back to the drawing board and ask the, the chemist, uh, that carbon fiber and I, now that we also know it's it's uh, carcinogenic, how much water does it take? You know, how much energy does it take to produce? So, so there are a lot of things that you then have to go back and and reassign those design parameters for examination. So we're thinking about simple tech pilots uh, where we uh, just get that design thinking uh, process into play. And we have Kenya, uh, we're, we're looking at the hub here, looking at circular materials pathways in Cameroon, uh, their strength is, and it's an architectural firm. In Kenya, we have a multidisciplinary, multi-stakeholder. In Cameroon, they're leading with an architecture firm. Uh, and actually in Kenya, we partnered with an architecture firm too, because we need that design thinking. They're called Nico Green in Cameroon, it's course architecture and looking at how you take the indigenous concept, like everybody says, oh, a mud hut and a thatched hut, and how do you turn those into structural biomaterials? Here we're looking at if you have sort of cement and all that, how do you then uh, turn those into circular material pathways that are safer and use that within the cultural heritage? And then in Ghana, they have a team at a Chesi University uh, it's uh, chemists uh, and especially uh, biochemists and computer scientists, and they're able to uh, work on uh, environmental sensor pathways. And that means thinking about the type of microbes you could use to detect mercury in the environment or things like that with a, a sensor. And then putting them on the same uh, type of work plan so that uh, you could then create spaces and, and ask the same question at the same time. This is just a quick overview. Um, a question we get a lot from corporates is, if we want to do this design thinking, inclusive design with the community, what is the cost? And sometimes they think it's the equivalent of maybe a 10,000 pound or 10,000 euro. Uh, engagement just to get a few, you know, you, it's like marketing, you, you, you design your prototype and you get a, a survey and you get opinions, but it's actually a lot more detailed than that because you have to start uh, uh, getting the data and, and figuring out, and this is assuming that you have just drafting the agreements, drafting what you're going to come up with, getting data driven drafts, not a, uh, 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 ideation, because you do have the ideation, but to do this commercially, they have to be data driven. And when you don't have that data, then you start having to engage in uh, more in-depth fo focus groups and then f figure out how to analyze that uh, focus group feedback in a way that then gives you the um, commercial target that you're looking for. Uh, develop 
this is just to think about if we were to develop templates, like within Poster Lab, if we wanted to have different templates for, um, let's say we're going to try and say uh, we wanted to use bamboo. So how do we develop the template that is commercially viable and uh, that we're going to allow everybody to use that meets scientific rigor standards for non-toxic bamboo uh, structural steel elements? So we have to develop that 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 codified set of parameters to put in the template, to put it into uh, Poster Lab, then we need to actually test and see if the businesses that are innovating or the businesses that are on the outside would actually be able to use that in their green construction design and see how they react to that and see how they react to the template. And then you still have to deliver a report to the regulator because uh, they're, they're watching very closely to see how that so it's it's not an insignificant sum uh and this is just so that uh corporates and others who are asking you know what you know every time you talk to a business they're like what is the cost of this uh being able to tell them uh what to expect is it worth it yes uh we, you know if you can consider that there's in kenya alone there's $1.8 billion in terms of gap, in, in terms of the addressable market for this type of circular material product. Uh, in Africa in general, and uh, looking at 76 billion. So you've got, you've got wiggle room in that market to be able to justify these kind of uh, costs. And then we, we're posing, uh, of course, we don't have data on that, but what we're saying is that if we also start looking towards how we work on the regulation side, we've just been assisting the State Department of Public Works with uh, greening, figuring out how to introduce greening elements into their draft building code. So if we start saying that, then we want behavioral change by creating green district economic zones. The multi, this is where human innovation and what I was telling you, the unknown. So to answer, the, here's where we'd have trouble. We don't know how people are going to react or what they're going to, when they see something, what they're going to do with it. Um, when they, uh, you know, how they're going to apply the technology that's released. But we, we assume there's going to be multiplier effect in terms of end uses there. And then this just gives you a 10 year work plan and 10 years um, looking at uh, research, like for example, if you're going to introduce uh, nitrogen uh, technologies that reduce nitrogen in, in water use for farmers, there's studies that show that the amount of um, market pull, which is the demand side of the farmers versus the market push, which is the regulation for reducing that nitrogen in, in the water. And the reason that you need that market push is to sort of to create a level playing field. A lot of times without the regulation, you'll have one farmer saying, oh, that's good, but I, I there's no need for me to reduce that nitrogen. So then you need that. And then the researchers being in the middle in terms of uh, finding out what works best on both sides, that process takes 10 years. Uh, so uh, we've al always been asked, you know, can you accelerate this? We're, we're going to try. This is uh, something new for us. Uh, what we're going to try and do is just then scope that out into different things. Uh, for example, spaces within buildings and energy efficiency. Yes, there's LED lights, but people are also asking us a lot about sewage disposal. And that's not necessarily things that come to people's mind at the forefront when you hear net zero spaces between buildings, you probably think of interior design. So that's why you see this uh, first layer is looking at um, how do we take spaces between buildings, energy efficiency on um, uh, sewage disposal, and then um, looking at um, what are the thermal in indicators and, and uh, walls and, and thermal. And it sounds a little strange, but um, so one of the things that you can do with membrane bioreactors is uh, use some of these uh, vertical uh, pipes, piping systems for heating, cooling, chilling, and all of that. But then you're running sewage. So, but some, like somebody pointed out, but you're running sewage through that pipe anyway when you put in your toilet. So those are the kind of fun fun debates that we start having about what, what are you going to do with that 
so, sort of um, nutrient water is actually what it ends up being. So um, what we're, we're, we're saying is that, you know, we, we really appreciate not only uh, being able to work with Postal Lab and, and put all the information in one place so that we can start having those discussions with different across different uh, villages and the different networks. Um, our role is more to support entities in the technical advisory discovery as you're moving through all these discussions and to sort of curate those discussions, uh, just like we're having today, and always enjoy uh, being a part of uh, working with you guys. Perfect. Thank you very much, uh, Cecilia. Um, is there, I mean, we are, we are obviously towards the, the end of, uh, of today's discussion. Um, is there any, I mean, anything that you would like to to share, or anything where we, what is there anything you you need, or any things you, you you would like people to support you? I mean, you are talking about this global uh, village. Uh, anything you would like, anything you're looking for that you think the audience might be might help you in one way or another? Definitely, um, uh, people who love to think about this type of complexity. Uh, we would definitely love for you to connect through the Postal Lab team. Uh, they're, they are really good at uh, helping, and there's a component of your system that uh, allows people to uh, uh, announce their expertise. The other is um, templates. So uh, this, this innovation landscape, this, this fusion space where science is talking to industry, is kind of new. Uh, science has, uh, um, not that it's not been done. Of course, you have a lot of uh, chemical companies that have done innovation for decades, but this open in dialogue with the society while the R&D process is in its early phase and looking to bring in that, um, so you're not just pitching to a closed session of investors, you're asking those investors to how they could also direct funds to um, communities for citizen science research. And if anybody has templates on, on how those work, um, that would be good. Uh, open open source sharing templates, I should say. <laughs> okay, no, very good, very good point. What I propose is that for any of these people that actually have these skills to support you in, a, in, a, in an efficient manner, uh, maybe you can um, share one of the link, you know, on, on Postal Lab and post it into the LinkedIn uh, event so that people are directly the link to, uh, uh, let's say, create an account and present themselves slash the organization to you. And then you can um, follow up, obviously, directly on Postal Lab. Uh, but thank you very much, Cecilia. Like I mentioned at the beginning, a lot of knowledge, a lot of things that what I want to I tell you guys are being stay focused. There's going to be a lot of things to learn here today. Uh, and I think, uh, Cecilia, you, you really, they really live up to, to, to this expectation. Uh, thank you very much again for your time. Thank you for sharing. And uh, all the best to, to, to you and the team and CSTI. And I'm going to, to summarize by uh, the, it, takes, it takes a village. I really love it. I, it takes a global village, what you were mentioning yes. at some point. So, guys, stronger together and it takes a village. Thank you very much, Cecilia. Take good care Thank of you, you and we keep in touch. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Cecilia.